It's Friday. Not that long. Come on. Stay with me. Don't go to the pub just yet. You go to the pub in 40 minutes. I, I want I want curry sauce. It's fine. CPD, spin that off. Weekend's coming. Oh, that. I've got a super cool live stream special. 20 seconds. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live stream special on a Friday. I promise I won't keep you too long before you go to the pub, before you finish for the day. However, while I've got you and you're killing a little bit of time, we might learn something today because I have an awesome guest from the industry who I know before. She's been an architectural technician, is an architectural technician, BIM expert, extraordinaire, and career consultant. So, that's the whole point about this is to get people on who have done the job, who can get, give you advice with you in your career. So on that note, can I welcome to the stage the fantastic Vanessa Casabon. Vanessa! Woo! Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here. Well, here. Thank, you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Vanessa, for being here. Now, while I know you, some people in the live stream might not have met you yet. So maybe you can just, first of all, Tell us a little bit about who you are and your background, first of all. Yeah, so um, I studied architectural technology, um, moved into architectural technicians, worked in the environment of BIM, um, moved into recruitment. Um, and I also had that time when COVID threw us all off and um, I learned some skills in coaching. So I did that as a profession. And so now I'm a career strategist. So I support and help others in their careers, um, building up on their strengths, um, helping them pivot themselves in terms of their changing or just develop themselves so they can kind of ex explore and um, what's the word get to the next step in their careers so that's what I do at this time and um, it all started from me just working in architecture brilliant well I appreciate you being here you're in the right place because we both we guess me and you both are uh, we've gone uh, through the industry a little bit because I studied architecture and you studied architectural technology then. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Tell me about that then. Just wind me back to the clocks. So, so what yeah, happened? So architectural technology is um, really fantastic because it gives you the the information concerning the construction, contract law, um, facilitating management, um the science of the building it kind of gives you all the kind of backbones of the skeleton and um, so it's not just about designing um and um there's kind of two kind of career paths you can really take one would be a chartered architectural technologist and the other one you can kind of continue as an architectural technician and build on those skills um, and become a profession in that area or that niche and some people do their niche in like uh, passive housing some people do their niches in different areas of sustainability. Um, so that's the kind of two routes that it kind of bridges. And we, we support architects. Brilliant. Well, I tell you what, my technical drawings were questionable. <laughs> so I'm sure you could, you could still <laughs> teach. Yeah, that's all, Steve. <laughs> Mate, I, I, tell you, I tell you what, yeah, you don't want to look at them. Uh, so I'm curious, Vanessa, when was the idea in your head? So you must have been, when did you think, do you know what, I'm going to study architectural technology wind me back the clock what happened well to be honest with you it started with a conversation with my father he was just telling me I've got to do a job and I was like yeah I want to do something RE and he was like mm -mm, that <clears throat> you know that's not going to work with me so I spun the work he said to me actually to be a lawyer I was supposed to be a barrister um and I kind of compromised with him and I did work experience there I didn't feel comfortable I didn't feel like I fit it in very well um, and I took a survey with all the barristers and they said if they had to do their life all over again, they wouldn't be a barrister. And I said, you know what? I'm not doing that. So I, I spun the word architect to my dad. And to this day, he still thinks I'm more of an architect than anything or was more of an architect than anything. But it was a conversation with my dad. And so that was an influence. He was influential in my career path. Um, and so that's what led me into architectural technology. Um, so, yeah, in short. 
I love it. I, me too. I, you know, the, there was the, the romantic idea of designing buildings, and I was like, I have to do that. And so I kind of as well. So I went into architecture as well. Yeah. Now, I enjoyed the course. I learned a lot. However, when I went into the industry, I still enjoyed certain parts of it. But for me, Vanessa, I don't know about you. However, it was very different, it felt for me, than what I was studying before. The transition was quite a bit of an initial shock to my system, yeah. if I'm being very honest with you. I mean, what was your experience? Did you fit right in? Um, or did you also have a little bit of that shock feeling? I had a bit of that shock feeling as well. And I think looking back, one of the reasons behind that was because um, I didn't have an understanding of the process of the business as itself in an architectural setting. Um, I didn't understand the different components and the parts in which um, bring a whole project together. And so I feel a bit like, oh my gosh, you know, how do I connect and collaborate with these other professionals? So yeah, I felt a little bit thrown in a deep end. Um, and then obviously the understanding of the projects. And so, you know, you're always gonna be learning. So you do get that kind of experience. So I felt quite the same, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite an eye opener. Now, there is something else that, because over the years we've spoken a few times, and the first time I was ever aware of you, Vanessa, it was not just because of your architectural technology skills but your BIM skills yeah. now I have got a confession live on the air so I have used Revit and I had a beginner's course in it but I haven't used Revit since 2015 now you have used it much more right yeah. so I would love to hear your journey as well on on that front and when you started picking up Revit when it became important to you using BIM and how that got involved in your career yeah, okay. So um, I qualified, I uh, finished my degree as architecture technologist. And in actual fact, my director, the course director, felt that my modeling was brilliant. And I actually became a lecturer. So I was teaching grown ups <laughs> how to use software. It was crazy. Um, and through that, um, I learned that it was really, really important as I then developed my work experience in the field. Um, yeah you know it really is important to understand the fundamentals of that software understanding the components um, and really getting strong um experience strong knowledge of that software because i personally have made mistakes i've had a i'm not going to lie to you i can admit i've had a job where i've really butched it up thinking i knew how to use revit and yeah. it turned out really bad and i lost out on a on a job for that so Ooh. i would always advise people to continuously learn and practice because the software is always upgrading and it's for you to be able to be competent enough to be able to deliver uh you know the construction drawings in a way in which everyone can understand that information and obviously present it in a good quality so always always learn so you know you should have just continued practicing Steve. <laughs> i need to maybe i can pick it up you know from 2014 to 2023 <laughs> but I, I love what you said because, I mean, that's really half about careers, isn't it? You make mistakes all the time, even as yeah. in, in, in terms of careers or even in my business now. I'm making mistakes all the time. I made a clang in this morning. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. I think we got to move on. And and I think that uh, when you're a bit earlier in your career, it's easy to take mistakes to heart. You think you're a failure. You think you're rubbish. I'm sure when you, you crashed that BIM model or whatever at the time, you were yeah. extremely upset with yourself. However, it's picking yourself up and um, moving, moving on that I that I think is important. Tell me about one or two other jobs. I'm sure you didn't crash all the yeah, BIM models so then, right? I, I just wanted to add on that to be honest, Steve, because uh, yeah, part please. of the BIM process is to pick up on errors, is to highlight bits where you're not so skilled, and so therefore, one advice is if you're in that environment, if there's something you don't know really well definitely speak to the BIM manager um, or your project manager, whoever's leading that project to kind of say, okay, I might need to take a few courses or short courses just to make sure I'm uh, fully aware and understand, you know, the process of delivering this particular document. Um, so I would always advise to do that because um, like I've said, I've had, I've had a bookshop before. And also I would say the second point is depending where you are in your career, there's some, practices which are like architecture and BIM and then there's some that are in architecture interior design or architecture and engineering so really be sure about the business and yeah. um, the practice that you want to work for 
um, if you're developing yourself and going to that, that direction that they really high or established because I've been in practices where it's predominantly BIM and projects weren't necessarily exciting with design but once I was there after my mistakes there was no going back I, I knew what to do how to operate the software and how to collaborate with my other peers um, and how to manage data really really well and more effectively so sometimes it's to do with speaking out um, and letting you know your staff know that actually I might need to practice or learn a bit more or yeah. do that on the side or and definitely when you're moving forward to think about if that's the direction you want to go make sure this practice is well established in the environment of BIM and they can support you in your development because some of them have really really high standards now it's kind of a, a lot of them have integrated BIM in their in their projects wow well, that's really really useful and, and you're right being a BIM coordinator or manager at a a, a a a developer or or a multidisciplinary consultancy is going to be very different than yeah. an architecture practice and you're right even interior design i i'm not too I, some a lot of interior design companies are still using vector works right and compared to architects yeah. so it's it, it's kind of a different world and listen i still want to talk a little more about your career but you you raise a really interesting point and just before I ask you one question. We've got a few comments that have come in. Michael says, good luck. Oh, I'm not sure why. Hopefully we don't need. Uh, good luck for us. Yeah, good, good luck. I think we, we're still alive. Good so luck the journey <laughs> in your exactly. career. <laughs> exactly. We've thank got you. a few hellos come in. And Lola says, thank you for sharing your story about making a mistake. If anyone else has a question yeah. in the audience for Vanessa, please do. Put it in as long as it's you know PG thirteen and all that stuff. I don't want to get kicked off LinkedIn. Then then we'll bring it up. But um, you know we're, we're both open books and, and Vanessa's career is very interesting. So maybe Vanessa, what I was going to ask you is because uh, okay, studying architectural technology or I yeah. me studying architecture that's yeah. kind of a um, a clear career trajectory at the start. You 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 do that and now we're seeing one or two maybe masters in building information modeling you know bim courses however going a career into bim can be quite fuzzy like you mentioned and there's different avenues to do yeah. it because there isn't such a thing as here's a degree in being a bim coordinator yeah. per se yeah. so i mean what's your insight and thoughts on if someone's interested in going into that how do they begin or do you have any tips on how to go along the yeah. bim journey so it's, the reason why the situation is that is ultimately because, you know, we had the RIBA plan, we still got that. The BIM has, has been a process which we've kind of put, you know, like we had the bread and the butter's kind of gone on top and melted inside. And now it's part of, you know, the process in our projects. And so that's kind of why it's a bit fuzzy at the moment and we've not necessarily got, you know, an itemized degree for it. So I would say if you're open to starting or implement BIM, I would first inquire about, you know, first of all, your background. So you could be an engineering, yeah. which is fantastic, as well as in architecture. Um, so if you're in the AI, AEC industry or the built yeah. environment, generally speaking, um, I think you've got a good prospect from, from there on the jump. Um, Autodesk, they have a Autodesk certified professional certification. Okay. A lot of practices now, they use um, Revit, but there's also other softwares, but that is the leading uh, software in terms of managing, supporting and helping the model, creating models to uh, work in BIM. So that could be uh, one avenue. So I would figure out making sure that your software um, knowledge and experience is on point. And then also I would, um look into the types of practices which have BIM um, centers or hubs or they're really big on technology vr honestly mm. uh, a little nugget there take it if you're in the industry and you know thinking further ahead in the future vr is going to be in high demand a lot of architectures now are able to sell and um, the experience to their clients and stakeholders through the virtual reality if you're able to um, develop that skill that would be great um, yep. but for the foundation in terms of starting BIM technician is the position I would go for um, and um, I would connect with projects or practices that have implemented BIM in their projects and um, those are the kinds of uh, practices I would go into 
and again develop your software that's huge also do some um, external learning as well you've got other platforms I don't know. I'm not sponsored, so I don't know if I can mention those. <laughs> you, can, you can say a platform you like. Don't worry. You know, you I'll send them the them. bill after. It's okay. All of us have their own resources as well. They have their own yeah. resources for learning, and they're leading. Um, but, you know, you've got LinkedIn, Udemy, all those other courses um, where that can support you in the knowledge of understanding the BIM processes and understand the integration of how important it is to have, you know, common data and sharing that information so that, you know, um, errors, can be worked out sooner than later. Um, so yeah, do you think that's sufficient, Steve? Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's a really I think yeah. that's a really good point. And you're doing you're doing really well on your first live stream, even with me teasing you. So don't worry, you. You, you're doing <laughs> well. Jordan was actually one of the one of the most listened to episodes. He joined me on the podcast earlier this year, and he also says I would highly recommend also looking into understanding. A CDE, which I think means common yeah. data yeah. environment. Am I right? So there we go. Oh, and we've got another one where Michael says, learn ACC at Autodesk.com is Autodesk ACC CDF and um, CDE tutorials. My goodness, I got there in the end. Sorry, guys, it's Friday. It's been a long week, but um, the, li the link is there as well. All free resources, Michael says. Michael also did a podcast and he was one of the most popular podcasts that we released last year my goodness all the illuminati is showing up in terms <laughs> of them i'm 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 really impressed so um makes sense now vanessa what i was going to talk about as well so you know you've also seen have you and you give me a flavor of this but have you worked yeah. in like more traditional architecture practices towards bim consultancies as well can you give people the vibe of how the different vibes are in these different companies and how important it is maybe for people to find the right fit even if it's not right at the start yeah, yeah absolutely so ultimately within the bim process you have first you know the client the stakeholder the people that's going to invest their money in the project they have their kind of process of you know the viability um and liaison with the architects um and the key people who are going to support bringing this into fruition um so when you understand the whole process of you know start to finish of a project then you get to learn about what it is that you do why you're important what your your aims and and, and how um work of the bin manager so there's a few positions. There's BIM manager, BIM coordinator, BIM technician, um, and also information manager. Um, when you understand um, the structure and how something becomes from start to the end, um, that is very helpful. Now, we have a few sectors. So we have the architectural, which is traditional rebar plan, and they've kind of like implemented BIM in their processes. You have design and build, which is is more like a turnkey experience. So it's just one contract where I'm a client and then a, uh, a design and build practice literally um, picks the carpenter, picks the sculptor, picks all of the professionals and they manage that. And um, they are slowly moving into BIM. There's, um, there's, some, there's two leading practices that are huge with BIM with that, but that that's another another scope or another sector yeah. and then you've got the BIM consultancy the ones that deal with the information management which supports some of the traditional architectural practices and kind of manages um, and looks over their process to ensure that the common data the way they pass on information is correct the standards are right um, and they kind of help and ensure that everyone stays in the framework of the you know the BIM execution plans and, and so on um, and so there's kind of um three areas you also got the contractors they become more later in the stage only because they're, they're dealing with ensuring that you know what's to the plan is is being constructed and um, it's for you to understand um really more about your strengths so i've all i always say start with when you study architectural technology you have those modules um i have people who lead more to facilitate facilitate manager so they went into state real estate because they were strong in that and then I have people who were uh, did contract law, so they was a contract administrator, then they niched into that. And I had some people who really liked um, the science of the building and they moved into passive house. So I would say to you, 
based on your degree, what modules really were you interested in strong or you felt I could do this further and niche down? And I know it may sound, oh my gosh, I don't want to put myself too away from the crowd, but actually now in the market, a lot of um, professionals now or directors are really interested in people who know something really, really well um, and have an expertise in something because it adds a, a value or strand to the whole project in terms of the building. So I would advise people to um, niche down on one particular area, whether it's you know thermal bridging, whether it's passive houses, sustainability, uh, niche down, whether it's about, um, what's that, I can't pronounce that. That word, biophilic. Oh, that, oh you're, you're entering another actual now. I can't say that with my Welsh accent. But there's, there's, different, there's different niches and I would say to anybody, Definitely yeah. pick a niche and then become an expert in that niche. And I'm telling you, you'll be much more thought of, much more received. If you're someone who's an architectural technician, you've not got a niche, but you know BIM, that's great. But if you can have a niche, a particular area you work in, it's a, it's a good look for you. Very, very insightful information here. And I appreciate it. Now, a lot of this comes from your experience at, at the time, but equally, a lot of it comes from um, what you've learned, I'm guessing, in terms of recruitment, because like me, Vanessa, you fell into recruitment. No one really plans to go into recruitment. I certainly didn't. I don't know about yourself. You kind of fall into it by accident. And however, you can learn a lot of stuff because you get to yeah. see practices from the sideline and certain things. Can you walk me through what that was like in terms of recruitment, what you, you, you've you learned from the process, which now informs what you do in terms of career consulting? Yeah, so <clears throat> I learned through the process that um, a lot of the successes were happening because whoever was interviewing you felt that you can join the team. Mm. So the fact that you've got an interview, your CV has passed the mark, you know, you know, whatever those credentials, whatever the experiences you've had, you, 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 that's been ticked. Yeah. On the inside, you learn that actually the person you're interviewing, it's really about your personality. It's really about whether you can fit in their team or their structure and, and whether they can see you in another meeting with them. So I would always advise people in terms of the interview, if there's anything I've learned through hiring people, well, me hiring, but recruiting those and matching people up really well, is your personality. When you get in the interview, your personality must shine and um, ensure that you're always interested in what's currently going, ensuring that you are talking about where this business is in terms of their projects, what it would involve. Um, you know, you can find out certain information, but definitely the key is your personality mm, very very insightful and i agree with you i think an interview is and the, the whole point of actually getting the job really is to fill a need in the business and part of the the, the role in the interview is to conv convince the other person that you can fulfill that need in yeah. the business and you'll find that a lot of the candidates they're really scared oh my gosh um you know yes okay fair enough you know you might have to present your portfolio once again and talk through the projects but a lot of them get scared because they think they've not yet qualified but actually from you have the interview you've partially qualified it's really about that human connection and the one-to-one -one connection and I, and I always kind of direct my candidates to really show that they can be themselves and so I work with them on that so yeah well done no it really really makes a lot of sense in terms of the interview now you touched briefly on there at the start about you know if you've got an interview then the cv's done its job to get you through the door yeah. now can, if we can focus on the cv for a quick second because what i love is because i do a, a talk a lot about architecture cvs or more of you know what's an architectural assistant or an architect's typical yeah. cv and portfolio but what i love here is that there's there it, there's a there's a few differences aren't there of what's going to be on an architectural technology CV or or a, or a BIM coordinator as a CV compared. And, and often, because an architect will spend a lot of time on a portfolio, but an architectural technologist portfolio can be very different. It's Half the time, it's a set of drawings, and that's great. But can you walk through, first of all, what you've learned works quite well, in, loosely, in terms of a CV, and, and then if a portfolio is needed? 
cool. So mm, CV, loosely, what works really well. Um, what happened? Real good thing. Um, because it's kind of like a because with the CV, obviously, it's individuality. They take yep. into account how many kind of um, softwares, what softwares, your competency of softwares. That's a huge, huge thing. Yeah. Um, and definitely attention to detail because from the jump, as an architectural technologist, you'll be doing a lot of detail and drawing. <laughs> so yeah, if, you, you uh, don't want that typo. Way it um it can it can kind of be a thing. Um. But also I found, which is interesting, is there's a sort of standard way of layering out your CV. Sometimes it's okay to actually put your experience first rather than your qualifications because yeah. a lot of the time, um, well, when I've been hiring and I've, and I've had a quite a few contracts, um, they, I've had, you know, conversations with just phone calls. A lot of the time they really want to understand what projects you've worked on. <clears throat> how you've used your skills yep. and so if the experience part of your cv i i i wholeheartedly say go fat on that go fat on that but structure it in a way in which you can get some, some form of concise uh consistency or conciseness in the layout but i definitely um i've learned that they are big on what you've done in that experience that you've had if you've had those experiences it makes sense. Well, thank you for sharing that. So I agree. Attention to detail is key. I mean, the CV and portfolio should be the most important document of yourself because it's your career. It's you, isn't it? And I think that um, while I'm not too worried about a typo, sometimes people who are reading the CV can be put off. And that would be a shame if it doesn't get you through the door. So thank you for sharing that. And I know you do a lot of career coaching. And we're going to talk about where people can find you. LinkedIn, first place to check. But, but <laughs> yeah, but just before we do that, while I got you, I want to talk about things in the wider world as well. Because so since you've done recruitment, um, you now do a bit of career coaching. And equally as well, you're involved in a lot of EDI issues in the industry. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts because, you know, there's there's two things that's going through my mind as well. Uh, you know, the, the construction industry, the built environment industry, predominantly before has more men than females, first and foremost, yeah. right? But then equally, you're proudly as well, a black woman in the construction industry which is amazing as well from your perspective what's it been like you know being you know in a, in a minority going through the the industry what's your has it gone better in the years you've done it or do you think there's still a lot of work to do yeah so <clears throat> yeah so um well when i was working um a lot of the time i i, I didn't see much of people my same that, you know there were some practices where there was like literally two women it was me and we all kind of gravitated as soon as possible because we're like yeah, no, do you know what I mean? so yeah. there's a two there's a two sides to it um you know as a woman you know it, it's nice when we are in an, an environment our practice and there's other women because we can have those relationships which is really important for women just just generally saying <laughs> so um there's been definitely growth in that definitely a hundred percent um in terms of me and you know the color of my skin i feel there's still more more things to do so yeah. i'm i'm part of the nawic which is uh for women in construction which that's really i'm passionate about now and um so i'm working with these groups of women um just to create an environment where women can collaborate with other professionals within this industry and um, I've, I've witnessed different things um because a lot of them are male orientated and so I've I've kind of seen a development and it has improved, I must say that. Um I still think there's still more time to go. And I remember in my early experience, because um I first started doing interior design just to dabble in. And um I met I went to this meeting and it was um full of women. I can't remember what it was to save my life, but it was very impactful. Um so I think we still need to continue to have groups of women that are supporting and influencing those girls, the younger women, um, in terms of ethnicity, I definitely think we need to um, ensure that we're getting an inclusive type of um, environment. 
because um you know a lot of the time it yes we get there but yeah. how do we stay there and a lot of the environments i've worked personally i've part of not staying there has been the fact of my social space with my colleagues i mean i spend half my day most of my years my time with you rather than my family you know so yeah. with that being said you know you've got to have those interpersonal relationships and that's really key and i think there's still more growth to be had and um, but definitely it's, it's been positive um moving forward i think so. i agree i think it's going in the right direction you yeah. know as a as a young welsh gay man myself before it felt like i was the only gay in the village now there's a lot more yeah. you know it's it's going in the right way it's definitely going in the right way now changing the subject slightly from going back to before david james says cvs always need updating and never ending work i tell you folks david <laughs> i feel your pain but you're right as we go on so does that cv and, and half the art form can be condensing it a little bit as well now vanessa we're gonna tell everyone where they can find you but you know it's, you can find you on linkedin a few other things before that though i like to flip it around okay because i've been asking you lots of questions and you can ask me if you'd like one or two questions okay. whatever comes to mind and you know we've met before it, uh, we haven't scripted this you can ask me whatever's on your mind so whatever <laughs> comes whatever you comes to, to train, you know we're doing this spontaneously <laughs> yeah exactly so you can put me in this in 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 in, in the firing line if you want but, i'm actually going to share something that i explored and i want to know if you agree or think it's true or, or either or so okay. i've actually learned that um in your on your cv you actually don't have to share all of your jobs on the cv correct yeah you i think well, it de it de it depends if you haven't got many jobs because you're early in your career. Then yeah. half of it's about building up the one or two that you yeah, got. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, oh, I need to fill the page, kind How of thing. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm I'm not against it. Or the other thing is that I think I think it's important to say well, it depends. If you're at the end of your career, maybe you have a job for a long time, you will talk about that yeah. about more. You know, so sometimes directors say, now let's be like hypothetical so if i was like the director of Stephen drew architects or whatever yeah. i don't know how good the quality of work would be but let's pretend i was there then i and i was there for 20 years i might talk about that more but i, yeah. I wouldn't talk about when i was a part one of the epr architects because it's a bit like you know it's from ages ago yeah. and, I, and i think that you know it's okay to focus on two or three of your most recent jobs and then kind of summarize the bottom and oh for example say now when you start in your career you've been contracting here or there you might kind of bunch them up a little bit and focus mm -hmm. on another role so i think i think it's okay over a length of time and i i think that you should you should selectively edit things yeah. half of it when yeah. you go on yeah. with your career i think but it's editing isn't it and i think that no one likes a cv which is bumming 20 to 30 pages long a cv should be two pages three pages yeah. maximum yeah. and you know the portfolio can expand upon that but you know no one wants to look at a seven page cv they just get bored in my opinion what do you think definitely i agree so i think the nugget here which i wanted to say this because a lot of people don't know you don't necessarily have to share every single job that you've gone to yeah. when a cv is is a marketing tool it's a space where you, you you're presenting to them look what i've done in the past which is relevant to what you need right now so yeah. just to kind of a lot of my candidates are like oh my gosh they've given me everything and i'm like you actually these three jobs or these two jobs were huge they were impactful you spent how many years on it and i think it's relevant to the position so just so you know you don't need to have all of your jobs on the cv but not everyone knows so i thought that would be great for everyone to come kind of i i agree it's and again like you know think about the first project you've done in university you did it a while ago <laughs> it wasn't the best one why are people still putting it in let's move it all over Maybe focus on, on <laughs> focus yeah. on your most recent greatest project yeah. you're you and chances are the job that you're currently in usually not always however usually yeah. you've done more responsibility it's probably a bigger project and therefore it's the one to focus on francis yeah. agrees that it's a really interesting point but the cv and portfolio 
um that is good to know but v any other questions you can, we can do a few if you want it can be <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sorry. Any, nothing's come to light but i'll bite in if you want me to <laughs> go on go on yeah so maybe we can do it i'll tell you what i'll do really quickly because we've got one or two minutes before we go so i'll give you my top rundowns of I, what i think is important in a cv and portfolio right. And then you can give me yours. We can do top five and we can, you know, I, if I, because I've gone first, if I'm stealing all the good ones, you can still say them. So number yeah. one on the CV, which I think is so important, is you touched upon it first and foremost, is actually spell checking the thing. It takes one minute, but when you're writing the document, you're in the zone. If you're anything like me, there's going to be typos all over the place. And what also when you reread the document, because you understand what you mean, your brain doesn't pick up the typo. So you've got to yeah, give no. it to someone else to show. That's number one. The second one I think is it's important to do good graphic design, the clean, minimal, if in doubt. I wouldn't go too, too, too crazy one way or the other. No one wants like a big, colorful black background that's going to cost loads to print and stuff. I think something clean, elegant, white backgrounds are probably a good starting point, you know. And the third bit that I always say is, as which you touched upon beautifully, is editing things down because no one wants a big essay. And, oh, yeah, the last one that I think always people forget about is that they do a CV and they, and they save it and they go, Stephen Drew's CV version 1 2020. And and then it's like you're gonna send that piece of piece of rubbish out. You know, you gotta name it properly. Everyone forgets that. Oh, they export it in a million resolution, and then it gets clogs up people's inboxes. So you, you got to get the balance. Um, well, but, I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna jump off to the portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, this one I, I I've got to tell you. On your portfolio, make sure, especially if you're showing construction drawings or any detail drawings, you can read the annotations, the actual details. Oh, yes. Please. Um, it's imperative because you're, you're not just showing the image. You're showing that you can understand the layers of materials that is needed to put this together. So make sure the text is actually readable on your portfolio when you're doing your drawings okay um mm. obviously that's more architectural technology rather than architecture because we, we do more concepts with the architects doesn't it <laughs> exactly. so yeah make sure you can read the text of portfolio um if you're going to do any um construction drawings you can just give them the actual if you have permission you can do the um actual pdf you don't necessarily have to shrink it down and yeah that's mess around it. with it it's not a presentation it's actually your uh, example a sample of your work so make sure you can read it make sure that the resolution is clean and, and precise um I'm, I'm moving more of the architectural technology sorry but it's what it is um again the skirt is useful you had the cv about um it being the clean cut color um what usually is great with um i i felt is um if you have sort of a a dial um, about the particular softwares, like yeah. how strong or weak or whatever. That's that's great. That's always good. Always put in your softwares. Always put in your extra certifications, short courses. Always put that in there. Um, another tip would be um, do your research on the role. And by doing your research on your role, you will understand what is required and then you would be able to understand oh have i done this before and make sure that somewhere in your experience is demonstrated if it's not in the cv definitely demonstrate that in your portfolio the whole point of this material is to um, show what you can do okay so um i think that's another tip um again i think you know those basic ones you said steve you've stolen them to be honest i did i went first that wasn't very gentlemanly <laughs> the, the portfolio and the graphics and seeing the text i don't know I, I can't get enough of that honestly i cannot get enough make sure that is absolute i want to see the 20 25 millimeter text <laughs> that's right it you gotta be able to read it i think it's so so important we our our jobs have been made easier because we've had one or two people that have 
um, and uh, put in a few comments as well. So Sonda says, I've had this conversation with someone and asked them, how long is your portfolio? And they said 60 pages. And I said, it's not a design and access statement. Portfolios should be 20 pages or less and CV um, three pages max. I totally agree. I think that's a really good guideline point. You know, it can be less than 20, maybe 21 and the max. However, that's a really good rule of thumb on the portfolio if you haven't got your point across in 20 pages you almost you almost risk the chance that you're going to lose people because they're going to go on further and get you know not that impressed with it vanessa you had a point to yeah, say that question. please tell me share with us yeah i have my views but i just want to obviously see what your views are yeah, yeah what's your views a little bit touching on this portfolio stuff yeah. with sharing your portfolio online yeah, and having it in a PDF because when you have it online, you can sh you can kind of I guess have more control. But what do you mean, like a website, like Vanessa? Is that what you're thinking? No, I just said online. However, you oh okay, or oh, you've really opened up the Pandora's box. It's yeah. uh, I I think that I'm always cynical, and that's the key word I'd say of how the person is going to view the document, how much time they're going to have, how much uh, restrictions. So where I'm going with this is that a lot of companies I've worked with on recruitment want the CV, the portfolio, and if it's not there, they don't see it. And so I've said, met a lot of people with these beautiful websites, amazing, and sometimes they get, don't get looked at. However, sometimes, especially more in the BIM digital world, where the employers are more open to this stuff because they're quite techy. Sometimes they will look at that website. So my view is that this the CV and portfolio should stand on its own. However, it's okay to still have a website if you want or a QR code. But as long as you realize that there's a chance that they might not get there, you know. So you can have your beautiful website that is probably good for your own personal brand, anyways. A lot of companies though will still want a PDF, or even worse, some companies still print out portfolios. Oh, all these trees <laughs> that are getting cut down. I mean, I like to look at them digitally. However, when when you're printing, it goes back to what you talked about, uh, Vanessa. Are the drawings going to come out okay? Are they smudged? How is this PDF? So we've got a lot of restrictions. So my view is conquer the pdf just get that done and then if you want to do the cool extra stuff do it for yourself be proud of it maybe you can even show it in the interview you just can't rely on it does that make sense though is that useful yeah, yeah, it makes sense and i find that so interesting because um especially those that are job seeking because remember you, you did touch on uh personal branding Mm -hmm. And a lot of advice is, you know, have your portfolio online, make sure it's accessible and people can check you out um, and, and so on. So I would kind of hone it back and think about what it is that you want to accomplish um, to make that decision whether or not to have a website or, or go online. Because are you a, a leading profession, i.e., uh, a sustainability consultant but have those projects as evidence then you may decide to have a website but if or a director um you may you may may or may not it depends upon you your profession your niche and all of those things it's not a paintbrush effect that's what i feel um, i agree i yeah. think some people have their stuff online and i think it's great um you know you have those portfolio books where you go through that's fantastic that's great but again, it's dependent upon what you're trying to accomplish and who you're trying to get a job for and what position. Um, the higher level you are, the probably the less you'll need a, a website necessarily. But again, it depends on your profession, i.e. if you're a project manager, you're not really going to need a website, are you? So mm -hmm. it depends on your position. I personally say and agree with you, definitely if you're in the construction industry and you, know, you deal with the drawings, you deal with illustration or presentations or anything like that or showing the project that you've worked on, definitely have the PDF. That is your bread and butter. So I concur with you there, Stephen. Um, in terms of online, it's an extra bonus. It's great. Um, unless you're actually leading a movement uh, yeah. or 
yeah, being a leader, again, that will divert more into personal branding, then yeah, definitely go for it. Do you understand? So it, it's good. But I think the key thing I wanted everyone to hear is the fact of timing. So when mm. recruiters or directors, remember, you're not just the only person they might be looking at. So ensuring that you've caught their eye and consistency, PDF will secure that. Yeah. Having, even though you may think it's a link or a click, it's a diversion. Um, and unless you're doing graphics design, I mean, you know, then obviously saying that cool and, and show that. So it I can, kind of varies, but I wanted to kind of, I think you hit on the now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That I I uh, I've I've been talking I've been talking about it for too many years, Vanessa. So don't worry. I think it'll end up on my tombstone. How many CV pages should be in a CV and portfolio? But don't worry. There's a lot. There's a lot of worse things you can get known for. Uh, while we were speaking, Sonda laughed about his naming conventions on the PDF files, saying he used to put a CV title one for a recruiter, <laughs> one called CV two. Now don't do that. Don't worry, son, that you've learned your lesson. It's all good. It's yes. all about improving. I think if anyone uh, has a doubt, good to do your name with dash CV and portfolio. That's enough. You know? That's it. Simple. That, that's fine. Keep, keep it clean. Francis says, I always work on my portfolio in my spare time. I always thought it was important to improve and show the knowledge I've acquired. Well done, Francis. I completely yep. agree. Yep. It also can be quite rewarding. And equally, if you do it a little bit at the time, then say now that there's there's a shift in the current company you are or whatever. Yeah, it's not such a panic that you have to update a lot of work. So mm. I think it's good to kind of keep it in the background unless, for example, you're the business owner and then hopefully, well, if the business goes down, so do you too. And yeah, you will be updating that CV. <laughs> but he also says, Francis says, he's curious. He asks us a question. Okay, Vanessa, we've got oh, to concentrate. Okay. My goodness, I've got to think. It says, I'm curious if showcasing the work stages rather than the final product is equally important. I believe in demonstrating skills right from the start of the project is often crucial than highlighting the ultimate end result, considering the current perspective. Ooh, interesting. So, I mean, my thoughts on this are, if we fit, I'm going to think about it in terms of the RBA stages. Mm. It's very good in a portfolio to showcase a full breadth of experience and skill sets. So, for example, what I would say, Francis, is if everything was front end that you had in your portfolio, you're in danger of because the perception is that you're geared towards front end, not, right. set, not technical. I'd like to see a flow of it. So you may be your most recent project, if you've done all RBA stages, it might be quite good to show the planning, the technical, few images of construction and therefore that i understand as an architect that you've done old old stages right uh, right you might want to showcase certain aspects of stages more on other projects you can use that as your discretion however what i've learned from in terms of recruitment usually the experience which is more sought after is less design is usually technical and construction with a right, bit of design right, right. so mm. Francis, I recommend that you you cover all stages, especially on a, on, on the, your most recent project, if possible. And uh, I think it's crucial to show an overview. Um, the, equally, like you said, it's good to show the overview of the process rather than the ultimate result. And I wouldn't yeah. show the front. I wouldn't show the end. So that's what I would do. But Vanessa, do you have a thought on that? Would you show? I, the... I think I think that really works with architectures, but within BIM. Yep. You can do two different ways. So mm. if you're a BIM manager, information manager, you don't necessarily have to do the whole flow, right? Right. So the projects I've worked on, the 3D model, um, and you know certain areas like that. Whereas if you're architectural technology, again, we don't want to see the concepts or the design part. Um, mm. We want to see the construction drawings. So the drawings that were issued out or uh, technical uh, error. So maybe you was working on a staircase. So we want to see the details for that. You see, yeah. that could even be a niche of yours. I'm telling you, the niche thing is a, is a good thing. So I think for the portfolio, um, in terms of the technical architectural technologist, BIM, it would vary. Um, it's okay to show the final product in BIM. Um, but if you are more of a BIM coordinator and working as architect technician, you must show the technical side. It's, it's, and and, and we don't need the beginning and we don't need the end. We just need to show your competence. So I think when you said, I believe demonstrating the skills, that's 
obviously what we want to see and that's where the creme de la creme is so yeah you're, you're spot on well done yeah spot on Good. well that wow what a fantastic perspective so oh, thank you for sharing it. that that's really interesting sonda actually agrees that acts of for bim vanessa is bang on the money yeah. brilliant and that's why people should get in contact with you about it which we will touch on in a minute now be just before we go i'll do a quick speed run where andre says what about the format should it be for landscape for cv and portfolio what i would say andre is don't worry too much about should it be landscape should does it need to be free pages the advice that we're giving here is uh, is indicative of what we are thinking however you can deviate from it a bit i tend to think that cv should be portfolio and that um, a portfolio is probably going to be landscape however you might make it a way that works these are typically how i see them working but it doesn't mean you can't experiment if in doubt though go with what people mostly do which is you know portrait for cv and landscape for portfolio i've got a question steve Okay, go on. Very short and quick. Yep. Is it okay? This is a yep. thing that I've picked up. Is it okay to have your CV and portfolio in one document? Or as like no. a... Well, we go... Do, we it's, go like, 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 it's almost like a storyline, you know. Like, a, Is it okay? Well, it's controversial. So, as you know, we have a mutual friend and colleague, Hannah Funnel. She prefers them together. I prefer them separate. Now, there I <laughs> so like this, or even like the way you said this. We're all everyone has different perspectives. There's yes. no wrong answer. If a good CV and portfolio, which covers the basics of the, the CV really well, and goes into a portfolio and it flows together, would right. I? Is that good? Yes, I think great. Right. Maybe the drawings are really big, or like you said, you know, you're an architectural technologist. Do you really need to spend a lot of time graphic design in the portfolio? Uh, would it make sense a small page and then big drawings? No, separate. So I like to use it case by case. Yeah. I think that you just have to view like, how does my portfolio look? How does my CV? Should I separate them or put them together? Maybe you're one of those creative people that makes it flow through and, and that can be okay too but yeah. so, so that's my thought it's i'm not giving you one answer or the other i'm saying it's okay it can be either basically that's, that's the point that we're trying to make as well for uh, andre or andre i'm oh, sorry if I, I put the name wrong but the point is is there's no right or wrong it's about what's applicable because um again it might work that cv or it might work a portfolio and cv um Again, if you're an interior designer, it might be more advantage to have them together because yeah, like, yeah, you know, exactly. It depends on your profession, and and so us saying what format to landscape or, or portrait, it, it's really dependent on your profession. Um, but ultimately, it must be able to communicate your skills. Okay. Yeah, I I agree. I agree more. So we're 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 running out of time, but questions are coming in. So we'll we'll do a quick quick speed round. Um, Jordan Harris says one big issue with digital portfolios is device optimization, phone versus laptop and screen. I agree. The amount of directors I know will open up something yeah, on their seat true. on their mobile phone and a taxi, it crashes out, all that stuff. You're right. You have to factor these things in. And the last, last, last question I'll be on here there is a big one, which I'm going to condense, which says, what is the difference between a portfolio, between a project architect or a more senior position leading to an associate? And what should be highlighted the most to be considered senior? Well, senior architects an industry title where it's not a legal title, as you know. The ARB basically says the legal title is architect. Then you've got project architect in some companies, senior architect in other companies. So it means different to different places. I do think you could put um, senior architect on your CV. Um, but a, 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 what's the difference in the portfolio between a project architect and the senior architect uh, leading to an associate? Good question. When you're an associate, your career is going to, you've probably done five, 10 years to get where you are. It's going to be very intricate. A lot of the videos that I do online are more general towards students or an architect in their career. It's very nuanced the further you get in your career. And that might be the point where actually you do seek out a career consultant, which I can do, but also Vanessa can do. And on that point, Vanessa, you are around, you are available to help. So if someone's got a niche example, a bit like the anonymous gentleman before, where he's thinking, my goodness, how do I dissect 
my 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 career and and work things out. What do you what do you do, Vanessa? Where can people find you? Yeah, so you can shoot me on there on the LinkedIn that was up there. Just click it and then book a consultation with me on my page, and then we can have a one to one conversation, and I can support you in moving forward and and getting that job that you want. Um, I'm super excited. It gives me a buzz and I'm just I'm for you when it comes to you getting a job because I'm like that <laughs> but yeah let's do that if that's something that you want or interested in then shoot me there I agree well I'm one over so Vanessa your task in between career coaching is to get me up to date on BIM I haven't done it for 2014 so you got your work cut out for you all jokes aside though do get in contact with Vanessa hopefully this will give you an understanding of her thoughts and experience and i love the fact that she's worked in industry like myself i do think it really helps especially when it comes to career coaching it is good to have advice from someone that's been there and done it messed up the bin model and also can <laughs> offer you advice on on your career so get in contact with vanessa and thank you for tuning in uh, i really appreciate it vanessa thank you for being here as well stay on the stage one second i'm gonna end the live stream in a minute but for you that tuned in and answered and asked all these questions it really makes this much more fun for me and, and i'm sure for vanessa as well do get in touch with her and equally if you want to have a look at some of the resources on the architecture social.com do check them out i will put a link there for vanessa as well if you want to get in contact with her and um yeah there'll be more content coming soon i'm not too sure what i've got scheduled but i know there's some cool stuff coming so i will update you as soon as possible on that have a lovely friday and stay in touch i'm going to end the live stream right now take care everyone bye bye, bye.